Let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 25. And my text today is going to be taken from verse 11 and onward. We'll see how far we get. But I've entitled this particular study, Apples of Gold. And that's taken right from our text here that is tied to the statement, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. But let's go back to verse 8, because as we read down through here, and that's what I want to do is read through this entire portion, then we'll have a word of prayer. Because sometimes you read these verses and you wonder, well, what is the connection between them? And the connection is that this is the Word of God inspired. And who is it about? It's about none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone has said that the in the Old Testament, the new is concealed. And in the New Testament, the old is revealed. So the scripture is its own best commentary. And knowing Christ to be the very wisdom of God, and we know that he came in this world to fulfill all that was foretold of him, whether it was prophecy or picture or promise, we see all of this being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the proper way to read the scriptures. And so think about how this word would apply to Christ and how it is that he lived his life. He came to work out that perfect righteousness, not just in word and deed, but the very spirit of the law, so that when he offered up himself as that offering for the sin of his people, that God the Father looked upon his work as nothing but perfection, not only in his life, but his obedience unto death. So let's read that. Because I know a lot of times people take the book of Proverbs and think, okay, well, how can I apply this in my own life? Well, let's first see how the Lord Jesus Christ worked it out. Because if we're truthful to this word, by the time I finish reading here, every one of us stands condemned. These would be charges against us because of our own failing and our own depravity. But... The glory is that these charges the Lord took on himself and came and worked out that perfect righteousness that God might be just to declare righteous such sinners as we are. So like I said, when you read here, if you come away feeling better about yourself in reading this, as if, well, at least in that point, I think I'm doing pretty good, then you're still blind because in every one of these it stands as our condemnation, but in Christ, it's for his glorification. So let's read Proverbs 25, beginning with verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, and discover not a secret to another lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver, or as an earring of gold, and an ornament of fine gold. So is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary 
of thee and so hate thee. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. As he that taketh away a garment in the cold weather and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance of backbiting tongue. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a wide house. As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is the good news from a far country. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Gracious Father, I thank you for this word. And I know that in every way we stand condemned, not only by our deeds and thoughts, but in very words. And how we need your wisdom to live our lives in this world to the glory and honor of Christ. But I'm thankful that in everything we've read here, our Lord Jesus Christ is that perfect man who came and earned and established that righteousness to your satisfaction that you might be a just God and Savior, not on our account, but on his. So I pray that as we go through these verses in the time that we have in this message, that truly your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be honored and glorified in all things to see how nothing that he did was but to your honor and glory and to your satisfaction, even in the face of enemies who sought to bring him down and sought in every way to ensnare him, even in his words. And yet in all things was that perfect man. And I'm thankful because that's what's required of him as the substitute, as the one who represents those sinners that you purpose to save. And so may our eyes be open to him, and may he receive all the honor and glory for which we give you the praise in our dear Savior's name. Amen. So when it says here, go not forth hastily to strive, this is speaking particularly of the purpose of when someone offends you, that you're going to take them to court. You've heard people say that, that, well, I'm just going to sue him. And so here the warning is to not go hastily to strive. It could be going and striving individually with that person, but particularly in the context, it is in the sense of thinking you're going to take matters in your hand and go sue such and such. That's a, a common thing today. I'm going to get my Lord and I'm going to sue that one. Because it says here, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof. When all this is brought to light, it may be that you're the one that ends up being the cause and that the judge finds you guilty rather than the one that you're pursuing. And so in that case, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame, here's the one thing, and you think even in terms of our Lord Jesus Christ, he endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. He never took any matter against him to the human courts and sought human judges in order to resolve his case. This is why he came into the world, was that he might bear the reproaches of those that reproached him to the point where Peter writes about this in his epistle and says, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. He opened not his mouth, but commended himself to him that judges righteously, or judges rightly. And so we see in our Lord Jesus Christ a perfect example of this, that when those brought charges against him, 
He did not seek the human courts in order to resolve this matter, but commend, commended himself to his father who judges righteously, because that's why he came. The scriptures say he was, even to his death, he was as a lamb led to the slaughter who opened not his mouth. And that was necessary that he be that one that satisfied God's law and justice on behalf of those that he came to represent. And so it says there in verse nine, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. I find this to be exactly how our Lord Jesus Christ dealt with the contradiction of sinners against himself. How many times you read through the gospels that they plotted things against him that they had not even expressed yet. It says there, the Lord knowing their thoughts then would take a word and speak it to such a point where when they understood that he was addressing them, their mouths were stopped. And they could not continue to pursue in their own arguments against him. What a beautiful thing to read concerning our Lord Jesus Christ and how he endured this contradiction of sinners against himself. All the more reason for us to commend any situation we face to him and not try to take on men ourselves when they bring these charges against us, particularly for Christ's sake. Christ said, blessed are you when you suffer persecution for righteousness sake. That's a key word there. You're not going to be ill thought of for going and taking a nice warm bowl of soup across your neighbor when they're sick and not doing it to receive any honor and glory yourself, but people look at that as acts of kindness. There's nobody that's going to attack you for that. But I'll tell you where they attack you, where they bring charges, is when it says for righteousness sake, we're talking about a righteousness that is not in any one of us. It's that righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ came and earned and established and God approved. And when you begin to preach that righteousness as the only righteousness before a holy God, whereby a sinner can find acceptance, it's not in any works of our own, it's in his work. It's not in any sacrifice of our own, it's in his sacrifice. It's not in any righteousness of our own, because we have none, but it is entirely in the righteousness of another as a substitute. And if you want to face opposition and attacks, let that be known how it is that the Lord has been gracious and merciful to you, the sinner, apart from works. And those that are caught up in their own works and their own will and their own zeal and their own consecration, and all these things, you're stirring up a fight. And they will bring charges against you. But here's the matter here in verse 9, debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. In any case where there's opposition over the gospel and over these attacks, think about it as an opportunity, if God give it, to go and sit down and speak with that one who is opposing you. They're opposing you because they don't know Christ. And even in how you testify of him, it's an attack against them. So they're reacting. But don't go talk about them to another. See, that's what we see here in verse nine. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. It's, you don't go and say, well, I'll, I'll get back at you. And you go talk to another about that person. You begin to defame them. Now, this is a word of warning even ourselves when this religious world would bring attacks against us that we begin to talk about them to others. Can you believe that this is how they perceive or can you believe this is what they're saying? Well, stop and think a little bit. But for the grace of God, that would be me. The only difference between me and that other that is attacking me is God in Christ who's made the difference. Otherwise, as far as our nature is concerned, we're the same nature. We're sinners by nature. So what makes the difference? Who make a thing to differ? 
It's the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, period. Nothing else. And so we're to take these matters seriously and in any time of trouble like that, commend ourselves, even as Christ did, to him who judges righteously. Verse 10, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. That's the trouble with going and speaking to others about individuals rather than them directly, because sooner or later they're going to hear about it. And all that does is come back on you or me to where now anything that you've said about them, they're going to twice fold bring that condemnation against you, and they would do so justly. It's like one man said when they were criticizing him about certain things. He said, I'm thankful you don't know the half. See, we get, that's our own pride. We get all bowed up when we say some things about somebody else, but now when they come back and say some things about us, boy, now the fight is on. That's that flesh that's in us that would seek to defend our own cause. But we need not defend our own cause because anything they have to say about us is true. We're sinners. And the beauty of all of this is that we don't have to defend our cause because we have one who is our defense. We have one who came to this world and endured such opposition against himself. You stop and think about if he bore your sin or mine, he took those charges on him and willingly laid down his life to pay the sin debt so that when he had finished the work, there remained nothing but righteousness to impute to the account of those that he came to represent. So verses eight through 10 teaches us about this wisdom of God in how to deal with those that might find fault with us. They found fault with our Lord Jesus Christ without cause, to the point of killing him, putting him to death, and yet in so doing, they did nothing more or less than accomplish what God had purposed for that people that he chose to save. And so it's in this context then here in verses 11 and 12, that we have the title of this particular message, and that is apples of gold. It says here, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver, or like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. Now, when it speaks here about word fitly spoken. It's an interesting word. It means literally a word that has wheels. <laughs> In other words, that as it's spoken, it carries. There's a word spoken that's like on wheels. It, it carries and it comes to its proper place in its time. I think about preaching the gospel and declaring the word not knowing how the Lord would be pleased to bring that word home to the hearts of different hearers. I'm thankful that I don't have to determine that. What I do is stand and declare the glories of Christ and a word fitly spoken is going to be a word that God is pleased to take that word to whatever purpose he has determined to accomplish it. To some, they're going to hear it, and it's like water off a duck's back. They move on and think nothing of it. For others, it may be that it causes them anger when they hear a message that gives Christ all the glory. But for others, and thankfully that's the way it is when God's pleased to bless the word to our heart, it is a word fitly spoken, at the right time, as God determines it, it's a word of healing, or it's a word of comfort, or a word of strengthening that directs a needy sinner to Christ. That's a word fitly spoken. So it's rightly ordered 
when the Lord is pleased to take it and to bless it in its time and in its place. And when it's fitly spoken, it's, it's a word of grace. And we don't determine that, but the Lord does. It's as if, and I want us to go back here and look in Isaiah chapter 15, verse 4. It's a word that is, it's like put on a train or chariots with wheels that arrives at the appropriate time. That's how Isaiah uses the language here in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. It says, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. Now, this is not speaking necessarily of Isaiah here, but this would be the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. When even his enemies sought to go take him and, and bring him to the Pharisees, and those that the Pharisees sent came back empty-handed, and they said, well, where is he? What did they say? Never a man has spoken as this man. Just the very words of Christ, fitly spoken in his time, accomplished his purpose. I think about even when they came to seek him in the garden, and they had their staves and their swords armored as they were. And the Lord asked him, well, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, the way it's translated here in our Bibles is, I am he, but he is an italic. He just simply said, I am. And what happened? They fell backward. Such was the power of that word to let them know that they could do nothing to him or take anything from him but what it was ordained of his father because he is the I am. And so here with this scripture, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. In other words, speaking of Christ here, he had always his father's ear. He never spoke a word out of turn or out of reaction to what men were doing to him. His ear was open unto his father. And so that's what it says in verse 5 even to the point of giving his back to the smiters. Verse five says, the Lord God hath opened mine ear. I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spit. So again, we have here the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Were our salvation dependent upon how we reacted or not. None of us could be saved. But our salvation is in the perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ, having fulfilled the law and endured this contradiction against himself to the glory of God for the salvation of that people that he came to save. And so you can see how this relates coming back here to Proverbs chapter 24, when it speaks there as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. See how the scriptures are connected here? This is speaking of him as being that obedient servant, that no matter how much the contradiction of sinners that he endured, yet he was ever obedient to his father, never spoke a word out of turn, we're of such that even if for a while we might endure the offenses of others against ourselves, they keep poking sooner or later. This old flesh is going to react. And we might seem to be the most peaceable among men with regard to others, but sooner or later, they're going to poke and pick and stab to such a degree where we're going to react. Our Lord never reacted. That's an amazing thing if you want that alone as a study to go read through the Gospels and see how he was that obedient servant unto his father on whose shoulders the government lay. In other words, the whole of salvation was laid upon him. And one false step would have been enough to undo the whole matter. 
I know some say, well, he was God in the flesh, so he could not have ever taken a false step. And yet, as a son, the scriptures say there in Hebrews 5, yet learn he obedience. This had to be worked out in the flesh by a perfect man in order for that righteousness to be accepted before the Father. And so when we read the words of Christ, every word was fitly spoken, fit to, see this is where we don't have all knowledge, I don't. I dare not try to take a word and apply it to anybody here because I don't know how the Lord's gonna use it. Mine is to simply stand and declare Christ and his great work of righteousness that he worked out and the Spirit of God will make that word to be fitly spoken a word of comfort to those that God has purpose should hear. All others will be hardened. There's a message that's the savor of life unto life, and the same message is the savor of death unto death. It's God that determines these things. But to think about this word fitly spoken, and here it's described as gold in pictures of silver. Some sit there and say, well, is this talking about true apples that have that color of gold that's set in a fine silver basket so that when people walk by and see it, their desire is to take and to eat it? Or is it truly an ornament? It's just, they used to take apples and sometimes people will put settings of apples on the table that when you reach it, it looks so good, you reach for it and the host will say, oh, no, no, don't drink that or don't eat that because those aren't real. But the way they're made and laid out, it, it attracts. And that's why here in verse 12 is an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold. It's what attracts a person to another and causes them to see the beauty in that other. But either way, the whole view here of these apples of gold they used to do this back in the day. They would set these things in prominent places on the table and other things in the king's palace particularly as an ornament to the glory of that king or that, that palace and made it presentable. But this can be applied to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the word of the gospel as it's spoken. And as God is pleased to cause that word to, to be timely to weary souls, because that's who we are. We're nothing but sinners. And that it is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners, as Paul said, of whom I am chief. Nothing about this gospel would ever be attractive to any sinner because it doesn't give the glory to any sinner. You stop and think about how the Lord has drawn you through this word fitly spoken. Not by me, but by the Lord himself. He takes this word, and it's this word that he makes fitting, if you will, to the sinner that he's drawn. To cause them to see that they have nothing in themselves and that Christ is all. And how the Lord has used it to draw you to Christ. Whereas others that hear it, they're like, that's not for me. And they turn and they go their way to their own condemnation. But oh, what a glorious word it is when fitly spoken. And that's all we can testify. When someone asks you, well, how is it that the Lord brought you to himself? It wasn't in me. It had to have been the Lord by his spirit, taking the beauty. That's what this picture is here. The apples of gold and pictures of silver to see in Christ all the attributes of God that he came and satisfied that he might be that just God and Savior and draw me to himself. All the glory belongs unto him. And oh, the glory of that message of free grace. This is some, the, the apples of gold and pictures in here, this is something that some other has put together and made to be pleasant. That's what the Lord has done. Or else we'd be right there with Others taking those apples of gold and throwing them at others or throwing them away, discarding them, thinking nothing of them. And yet, oh, the blessing of the free grace of God. Sometime 
I'd encourage you, as I do every once in a while, to bring my mind to settle on Christ and who he is in a troubled world and a troubled heart. To start writing down all of his grace and mercy to such a sinner as I am. Count your blessings. As that hymn says, name them one by one. It's a good thing to do, to think of how this very grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, when he makes it a word fitly spoken unto our hearts, to see ourselves as the chief of sinners, and yet to know ourselves based upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be completely pardoned and reconciled and justified before a holy God. Oh, what rest and peace that brings when the Lord makes that word to be fitly spoken. A word of reconciliation to the worst of sinners and rebels, because that's who we are by nature, rebels, nothing good in us, and who by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ our peace is with God. He is our peace. And every condemnation that was brought against us in reading this word and his law now has been satisfied. And through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's his justifying grace whereby we stand justified before him. Can you see the beauty of the apples of gold and pictures of silver? I like to as the Lord opens my eyes to observe things in life that served as pictures of Christ. And that's what this is in pictures of silver, gold and silver. Think about what those represent. Those are the very glories of Christ. And when the Lord is pleased to open our heart, turn our eyes away from ourselves, because there's nothing good, there's nothing but rotten apples in ourselves. But oh, the apples of gold, in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beauty and a glory that it is. And so, when it says there, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. In other words, as the Lord reproves our sin and has opened our ear to see who we are, we take sides with God against ourselves. We're not trying to justify ourselves in any way. That's why I said when we began here, as we read it, if you find any way that you think you have lived right, thought right, did right, then you're, you're still blind. But oh, as the glories of Christ are set forth, and the more we see of him, the less we think of ourselves. And we're as that wise reprover, in other words, the Lord being that reprover, upon an obedient ear, that word obedient actually means a hearing ear. I truly believe that's the only way that we're going to glorify Christ and give him all the glory is when he opens our ear and he causes us to believe God and to agree with God because by nature we're rebels, but to agree with God in every instance, in every, every way, when he brings reproof, and that's why Paul wrote to Timothy that the scriptures are inspired, they're God-breathed, and are given for our reproof and our instruction in righteousness, our correction. But that's only by the grace of God, because there are many that will read this and say, okay, I know I've messed up, but I'm gonna start today, and I'm gonna start making things right. Well, at the end of the day, go back and Ask yourself, how did you even do throughout that day? You'd have to say, I failed miserably. Our resolutions are nothing. That's why we need the Savior. And that's why we need him to represent us before God the Father. Well, I'm going to stop there because verse 13 on, there's some more matters in there I don't want to quickly run through. But I pray that what we've heard already be blessed of the Lord, that he give us that hearing ear and that heart to hear him. For I said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And uh, he's worthy. He's worthy as our substitute and our savior and our redeemer. All right.